17 years ago, I had a dream. An impossible dream. A dream that began when I watched this. To corroborate that, to actually weigh a dinosaur. Ninety-two tons. That's about as much as thirty African elephants. Of course, we now know that ninety-ton estimate was way into deep fantasy. But that, together with the odd look, gave rise to my crazy dream of a one to forty of scale Argentinosaurus. Of course, I knew it was a pipe dream, since the deplorable trend was in fact smaller sauropods. The fast forward 17 years, and today, that impossible dream is almost realized as we behold my birthday present. This is the Pagato Titan from Era Terra, sculpted and painted by Ademar Pereira do Nascimento from Brazil. Sorry if I'm butchering the name. Ademar has been making models since 2008 has been kind enough to give us a lot of background information, which always gives me much greater enjoyment of a model. And as you can see, it's a whopping beauty. Now first, the space it will occupy. Horizontally, from nose to tail tip, it will occupy 82 centimeters, or 32.3 inches. And from the foot to the top of the head, it's 39 centimeters, or 15.4 inches tall, without the base. The base itself is about 1 cm, or 0.4 inches tall, so altogether 40 cm, or almost 16 inches tall. Ademar uses a head height of 13.5 meters, or 44 and a quarter feet, and a through central length of 33.6 meters, or 110 and a quarter feet as he prefers to use more realistic estimates, not exaggerated ones, something I heartily support. Now taken together, this puts it at a 1 to 35 scale. And believe me, for those of you who've been hankering after a 1 to 35 titanosaur, let alone one of the biggest, this will get you salivating. And to give you an idea of the immense size, here's my 1 to 35 humanoid. Imagine standing in the path of one of these awesome animals. The really exciting thing about Patago Titan is that unlike most of the other huge titanosaurs, it's actually pretty well known, with the remains of six young adults that give us a fuller picture than other titanosaurs hitherto described. Now, Patago Titan was initially hailed with the usual hyperbole as usurper for the largest sauropod ever, estimated at 37 meters or 121.3 feet and 69 tons. Now these have since come down, so Argentinosaurus for now retains its crown. But since the Patago Titan remains don't belong to fully grown adults, now who knows how large they could have gotten. The name obviously means Titan from Patagonia. Now this model is surprisingly light, weighing about, guess how heavy? 1.04 kilograms or 2.3 pounds. And let me tell you, it doesn't even feel like one kilogram. That's because it's made of lightweight fiberglass and it's hollow. Now I knew nothing about this material, but, but according to Ademar, he chose it because fiberglass is light and will help save on shipping costs. And yet it's still pretty resilient compared to resin. Yeah, we know how that turned out. To save weight, the fiberglass is in two layers, although he would have preferred three or even four. Believe me when I say it's almost as light as the PNSO Huanghe Titan, which is 875 grams or 1.9 pounds, and that one was made of hollow PVC. In addition, this disassembles into three parts, so it packs surprisingly small. So this might be a viable setup for affordable shipping for sauropods in 1 to 35 scale. Hint hint, to whom it may concern. So let's look at it. First, let's take a moment to simply admire the beautiful Titanosaur Bauplan with the Macronarian posture, that ridiculously thick and long neck, and tapering off to that tail. I've seen many Patago Titan skeletals, and my favourite is this one by Enrique Paez, aka Random Dinos at DeviantArt. But never have I dreamt I would have an actual 1 to 35 model right in front of me. 
In terms of colour, it's a nice counter shading of very dark to dark brown here. Then a paler, almost off-white brown in the ventral. In the head, I love the transition into crimson. And the ventral transitions to a pinkish white. Then in the tail, look at how that fades into an almost bright white at the tip, accentuating it. You can imagine how this animal visually signals at both ends, either for attraction or as a warning. And breaking this up, you have stripes in the neck and tail, or just overall the whole primary effect together with the form and the size is just stunning. However, if you get this, you can request your own colour combination. As I said, this breaks down into three parts, and thank goodness for that, or I don't know how on earth I'd put this whole thing on screen. Now this fits together by a screw mechanism, and is designed so well that just the right number of revolutions gives you a snug fit. So first, let's look at the head and neck. As with most titanosaurs, the head of Patago Titan is unknown. The most reconstructions use Bonitasaura, but as random dinos, or Enrique Paez explains in his post that I'll reference below, it may not be the best proxy, so he used Tapuyasaurus. Here, Adema used a combination of Tapuyasaurus and Antarctosaurus. You can see the squared off jaw influence here. And see how posteriorly the eyes are set. And these are painted with a lifelike glint. Adimar placed the external nasal openings here instead of the more rostral position often seen. The teeth are based on Ligabuesaurus. Unlike more derived genera, primitive titanosaur teeth aren't just confined to the front. Now each one is individually sculpted and carefully formed. And on the inside, you can even see the gum line holding them in place. The only thing I'd wish is a bit of yellowing in the teeth. But for most viewing, it doesn't make much difference. You can see here the detail in the scales and how they subtly follow the oral margin as, yup, these look like lips. And some of you will be happy about this. And there are pseudo cheeks here as well. I really like how this fades down into the neck. And speaking of which, as we move down, just look at the detail. You see, of course, the scales perhaps some superficial veins. No elephant wrinkles for this sauropod. And up here, we see the scutes capping those osteoderms that many titanosaurs have. Now, while no osteoderms have been found with Patagotitan as far as I know, it's an educated guess. Of course, I'm not complaining. Again, look at that detail. those scales. And some of these muscle separation grooves. Just loving the colour fades here as well. Now notice the various folds and textures. And you can really appreciate the thickness of this. And then the body, a thick torso with those massive slabs of meat. Now here I only need to give you a once over for you to admire the detail on the integument. Very realistic scales. Again, the folds and wrinkles. The 
these stutes. And I like how they're all subtly different from each other. You again appreciate the transitional fade in the counter shading here. And of course, those folds again. And on the underside, that massive vet like gut. And then the limbs. Now, first the arms. And going down, you can see just how pleasing that detail is. The lines of muscle. I must say I don't know about the orientation of what looks like the brachioradialis. Perhaps some of you could advise me. Of course, we sauropod lovers have a foot fetish, and here in the back, we see the detail of that scalation, including the soles. Our sauropods have three clawed toes on the feet, and here we see this accurately reflected, with the outer two being clawless. And of course, the hands, and here, now, where's that thumb claw? Now, surely this is an egregious mistake. Well, actually, no. And I'm absolutely delighted by this. You see, all those sauropods generally have that famous thumb claw. Titanosaurs eventually lost theirs. So you really should see just a pillar like we have here. Uh, you can make out some metacarpal separation here. Nadimar wanted to capture a transitional idea between the basal macronaria and the more derived titanosauria, so some hints of where the first phalanx is. I love attention to accuracy, so as much as I like sauropod thumb claws, having them here would have really spoiled the realism for me. And now finally, the tail. Now the length of it. It's a very pleasing and not exaggerated curvature. I really like that colour fade going from off-white to a more brilliant white at the tip. You could imagine this being a very obvious visual display. Now, bands are always pleasing to me. And you'll see more of those wonderfully sculpted scales and scutes. Now, this dinosaur comes with a base, and it's a very nice base indeed. Now, first, look at the texture of the sandy surface here. There's a graininess that really begs to be touched. You have some nicely textured and painted rocks here. A log, and then this vegetation. Now I can see how artistically this is shaped to complement the angle of the base, although I think a more naturally shaped patch might also look good. There are footprints for a more secure placement of the Patagotitan. And here is where the right forefoot will rest in a very natural way. Now this model does stand on its own, but three points of contact isn't as stable. And finally, we have the plaque, with Patagotitan Maiorum. The lettering is nicely weathered. And what a pleasant surprise to see that this plaque is actually on both sides, so you're not limited to which side you choose for display. And I really like it when artists think about these small things. Because as you can see, he looks amazing from either side. Now, this handy information card is also included, giving you facts and measurements. Now, for some science. 
and I like to talk about hands and posture. Titanosaur hands. We know that sauropods in general have a hand shaped like a horseshoe with a single thumb spike sticking out. But in titanosaurs, the clade which includes the heavier sauropods to ever walk the earth, this was not so in the more derived ones. The basal titanosauriforms began a trend of lengthening the metacarpal and losing the phalanges, or the digits. The later titanosaurs took this to an extreme. In Vulcanodon, the metacarpal was about 32% the length of the radius. Diplodocus was thereabouts as well. The macronarians, however, had metatarsals that were about half the length of the radius. Camarasaurus, for example, was about 47%. Eventually, in the later titanosaurs, the metacarpals get less slender and more robust. The fifth metacarpal lengthens, and concurrently, the digits are reduced and then lost, until in the end, all you have are undifferentiated, rather homogeneous, but very robust metacarpals. Arranged vertically into a strong hollow tube structure, they allow for direct contact and weight transmission into the ground, without interference from the fingers. In essence, the structure has this kind of plan, and really very reminiscent of the Stonehenge standing stones, and presumably about as solid and stable. The manus has now effectively become an entirely new segment of the forelimb, resulting in one of the most gravy portal structures that nature has ever seen. This allows the titanosaur to take longer steps, increase its range for better footing, and keep the main body further from the heat radiating ground. Posture. Now we obviously want to talk about the posture, because this Patagotitan has a macronarian posture, but the other Patagotitan I know of is this Safari, which has a more diplodicoid form, resulting in a more level back. So which is it? In the original paper, this is indeed the reconstruction. So if you just went with that, this would be considered accurate. Now what I feel, and I'm not a professional, is that skeletals and initial articles are more useful to show what parts were found and what were not. Indeed, you see a very similar skeletal in the original Dreadnoughtus paper, and now it's more often depicted like this. So I wanted to skim the surface of this topic. Now first to clarify, by posture, I'm not talking about how high the neck could be raised, uh, which has to do with flexibility and possible ranges of motion. Well, this can obviously be theoretically modelled to extremes if you consider the soft intervertebral discs. When I say posture, I mean a natural, energy efficient, most of the time pose the animal would normally and comfortably take, and so more of a natural extension of the trunk inclination. Titanosaurs belong to the large Macronaria clade, which includes famous Brachiosaurids like Brachiosaurus and Giraffa Titan and generally have a posture with an inclined torso. Now, this posture naturally holds the neck and head higher even in neutral position, without having to strain extremes of neck flexibility. A number of factors create this look, and I, mean, I can only touch on a few of them. Now, First, remember what we said, that as titanosaurs evolved, the metacarpal lengthened into robust tubes while losing the digits, effectively adding another segment to the front limb. This obviously increases the overall length of the forelimb relative to the hind limbs. But there's more. The shoulder girdle connects the arm to the torso and includes a scapular coracoid made up of the scapula and the coracoid, the cartilaginous suprascapula, and the clavicles. How its position with respect to the torso affects the scapular orientation. The resulting inclination of the scapular coracoid affects the entire body posture. And to be clear, I'm talking about this angle here to the horizontal. The humerus, or the arm bone, attaches to the glenoid here to form the shoulder joint. In the case of Diplodocus, the scapula is inclined about 60 to 65 degrees from the horizontal. This brings the shoulder girdle more dorsal with respect to the sacrum. In neutral, the dorsal vertebrae form a straight line, and since the dorsal neural spines get taller towards the sacrum, the dorsal contour would be taller near here, and then drop away from this point. In Camarasaurus, the scapular inclination is also 60 to 65 degrees from the horizontal, 
but due to anatomical differences, such as proportions and angulations of various elements, the trunk slopes down from the pectoral to the pelvic girdle. And this approaches the kind of posture we're used to seeing in macronarians. And this slope is even steeper in opisthocilicordia with a scapular inclination of 55 to 65 degrees. Thirdly, Vidal et al. in 2020 suggests that in addition to the points already mentioned, wedging of the sacrum and the posterior most dorsal vertebrae causes the presacral vertebrae to deflect upwards. You can see the difference this makes to the overall posture comparing their revised Spinophorosaurus to the original reconstruction in 2009. They suggest that all eusauropods had a wedged sacrum to some degree, so that in fact, they would have a more inclined torso than usually depicted. So all this seems to clinch the deal posture-wise, but for a few possible counterpoints. Now first we've talked about the metacarpal to radius ratio, but I haven't mentioned the humerus to femur ratio yet. The basal condition in sauropods seems to be hind limbs longer than the forelimbs. We see this in both the basal and the derived diplodocoids, with a 4 to hind limb ratio of 0.6 to 0.7. Now this is probably the picture many of us grew up with. In macronarians, the humerus elongates such that the ratio to the femur reaches about 0.8 to 1.0 in Brachiosaurus. In addition to the elongated metacarpus, this creates that long arm look we associate with the macronarian bowplan. However, the most derived titanosaurids actually show a decrease in both the metacarpal and humerus length, thus reverting to more basal proportions with a shorter fore to hind limb ratio. For example, in Opistol silicordia, it's back to 0.72. If Patagotitan followed this trend, then the trunk inclination would drop. Indeed, as you see in this skeletal, the humerus does look shorter. However, keep in mind that this is a composite of parts from six individuals, so we can't scale all of the bones with 100% certainty. However, remember the wedge sacrum? Well, according to Vidal et al., even when the humerus to femur ratio fell again, the wedging of the sacrum remained. And that's why, as you see here, as the humerus to femur ratios increase, reaching a pinnacle in Brachiosaurus, even after that ratio drops again in the more derived Titanosaurus, this slope remains, albeit gentler than in Brachiosaurus. And this gradual slope is indeed what we have in our Patagotitan. However, Dr. Michael Taylor has challenged this conclusion. First, the sacrum may have the wedging, but the final attitude can vary depending on the shape and the thickness of the intervertebral cartilage. Now, this is something we won't ever know. Now, second, even with the wedging, the torso angle will depend on how the sacrum itself is angled. Vidal et al. angle it such the tail emerges horizontally. But with anterior tilting, you see the trunk inclination fall. You can even get to a point where the tail base deflects upwards, as the trunk gets more horizontal. And actually, this is what we see in a few reconstructions. Another however, Dr. Scott Hartman returns with this argument. The tail base is horizontal because that's how the caudofemoralis will get maximum leverage during leg retraction. Any other position would be suboptimal for this. Now we are missing various bony elements in Patagotitan, including the sacrum. The remains we do have come from six individuals, and their relative proportions cannot be scaled to each other with 100% certainty. We can also only guess at soft tissue influences. So personal satisfaction with any reconstruction will depend on what someone thinks for all the factors. Now on my part, I'm very happy with this reconstruction, with a gentler incline, a horizontal tail, and this massive thick neck. But I have to say, except for doubt as to the degree of bend here in the elbow, given the olecranon size, I can also say, who knows, it might very well have adopted this posture, even temporarily. Now what did disappoint me, however, was the size, the small size of it. If you consider that Patagotitan is in contention with Argentinosaurus and Puertasaurus as the largest sauropod of them all, then you see the size next to these other models. 
it just feels anticlimactic to say the least. So now we get to the comparisons. Now first, we have to start with the most massive sauropod I have so far, the PNSO Huanghe Titan. You can see how massive this thing is, especially that deep and broad torso, again with those thick slabs of muscle. The torso is certainly bulkier, but when you look at everything, uh, the length, the relative proportions, just the presence of this titanosaur, the Patago Titan can stand very well on its own. Truly two impressive sauropods. Next, a couple of Macronarians. The W Dragon Giraffe Titan. The Nanmu Brachiosaurus. You really appreciate how big this Eratera Patago Titan is. Coming down in size, we have the Collecte Marmensisaurus, really one of my favourites still, with those beautiful proportions. The Eofauna Diplodocus. Now what about my OG big boys, the Carnegie Collection Sauropods? Here we have the Apatosaurus, the Diplodocus, and the Macronarian Brachiosaurus. I think you now have a very good idea of just how impressive, Most impressive this Patago Titan is. Besides the obvious comparisons, however, I wanted to show a few other 1 35 models just so you can see what a 1 35 scale titanosaur will really look like in your collection. So here we have the 1 35 PNSO Wilson T Rex, the 1 35 Eofauna Giganotto. and the 1 to 35 PNSO Triceratops. So that's it for the Era Terra Patago Titan. Truly a very happy addition for me after years of waiting for a 1 to 35 scale Titanosaur and with plenty of science going into it as well. Ademar told us his background research can take up to 60 days, especially for fragmentary dinosaurs, since that requires study of the entire group, so EPB can help fill in the gaps meaningfully. And as you can tell, I'm very happy with the result. And this truly is one I'm going to have on my desk for a long time to come. Now Ademar offers other models, which you can check out in the links below. And he has some exciting plans, including a T-Rex, and another he's keeping under wraps for now. Now what will excite many collectors are his plans to release models by ecosystem. Now imagine the diorama recreating the Judith River or the Namek formation with seldom or even never before offered dinosaurs. Now he should be launching his YouTube channel soon and I'll include a link to that when it's out. Now me, I hope that he will one day do a 1 to 20th Paleoloxodon. Now that truly would be the crowning glory of my prehistoric mammal collection. Alright guys, let me know what you think of this beast. I'll see you soon with something a lot smaller.